Well, good morning, everyone. It is so good to, uh, to have you gathering with us at Love's Creek Baptist Church this morning, even though you're not actually gathered in the building this morning. It's raining outside, and uh, so we have decided to, to move our, our uh, worship time inside. We're going to record the message, and we hope that you are, are uh, live streaming with us. We want to welcome those who are live streaming from uh, various places. We're, we're so honored that you would give us this hour uh, of your worship time, and we, we just our prayer is that it will be special to you. It will be a time when you uh, come closer to God. And um, again, we just thank you for, for being a part of our, our worship service this morning. I want to begin uh, our worship time by going to the Lord in prayer. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much. Lord, we thank you for who you are, for who you've made us to be. We are the children of God, and we couldn't be that, Lord, if it weren't for you. For all the work that you did, Lord, you, uh, you sent your Son to earth to show us how to live and then go to a cross and die there in our place, Lord, because there was no other way that we could ever have a relationship with you. And you loved us so much that you were willing to give up your Son for us. Lord, we thank you for the Lord Jesus who died there on that cross and was was buried, and three days later he rose from the grave to, to have victory over death, hell, and the grave on our behalf. Lord, when he ascended to heaven, he left the Holy Spirit here with us to guide us and to lead us and direct us in our, our daily walk, Lord. He left us a Bible to be able to understand how it is you want us to live, and we're just so grateful for that, Lord, and for bringing us into the family by faith in Jesus Christ alone. And so we, we come together today to, to show you that we trust you by opening up your word to see what you would have us to know. And Lord, we just uh, we praise the name of Jesus this morning. Let's pray that you'll be with us during this time and that you'll uh, speak to our hearts that we'll be more like Jesus at the end of this hour than, at, than when we began. Lord, I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you who are live streaming, uh, there's a, a place right there on the website just above the where you clicked on to live stream where you could print off a copy um, of our bulletin note page. kind of looks just like what's in here, and that, that way you can kind of follow along with the outline and with the different verses that I'll be uh, referencing. And, and so uh, if you haven't done that and would like to, you can take a moment to do that. Recent weeks, we've been doing some me different messages um, on our tendency to sometimes, even as Christ followers, to undervalue certain parts of the Word of God. Well, now, as you all know, unless you've been living on another planet somewhere, it's election time. It's a national election season, and once again, we have been given plenty of extremely clear instructions about how we to our approach the, the ballot box, the voting booth, especially those of us in the church of Jesus Christ who claim the name of Jesus. I believe that if the whole church nationwide, all of those who claim the name of Jesus, would simply follow the instruction manual from God's holy word, not only would our decision-making process be simplified, because often this is a time that we struggle with a lot about who to vote for, what policies, and so forth, but I believe it would simplify that, and we, the church, would also become a force to be reckoned with, with the politicians and so forth in our nation. But sadly, the fact is, even Christians, with a Bible in our hands, are so often divided on the issue of how to use our votes. We're about to see, as we open up God's Word today, that God has designed government, and man is not to try to change God's original plan. Matter of fact, Psalm 72, 11 says, And let all the kings bow down before Him before God, and all the nations serve Him. So I want to try and discern 
to see what, what that looks like this morning from God's holy word. So if you'll turn with me in your Bible to Romans chapter 13, and also uh, is a good place to begin, is always the beginning, we're going to look on our outline at the origins of government this morning. So if you'll look with me in Romans chapter 13, the first couple of verses says, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. Every person. This is God's plan. To the government. For there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. These two verses simply tell us this. God originates governmental authority. And therefore, Christians are to submit to the government as long as doing so does not require us as Christians to disobey God. We talked about a few weeks ago this, this, this subject, and there are times when that happens, and, and we have to disobey when that happens. But normally speaking, in other words, Christians should be the models of good citizenship for this nation. But our first allegiance must always be to God. So we find out that the origin of government is from God. Number two on your outline is the purpose. We read about that in the next two verses, verse 3 and 4, Romans 13. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. So here we find a twofold purpose that God has established for human government. First, government is to promote what is good. A government that causes those who do good to fear is in direct violation of its God-given purpose. And it's in danger of God's judgment as well. The second purpose of government is to be a cause of fear for those who do evil. The Bible says the sword represents the authority of the government to punish evildoers. Twice in verse 4, we read that the government is a minister of God. It's a minister of God to you. We don't usually think of government in that light, <clears throat> but it's true. But every government official will have to give account for their stewardship of their office <clears throat> to God. King Jehoshaphat gave a warning to the judges that he had appointed. <clears throat> and I believe that still applies to office holders today. We read it in 2 Chronicles 19, verses 6 and 7. He says this, Jehoshaphat said to the judges, Consider what you are doing, for you do not judge for man, but for the Lord who is with you when you render judgment. Now then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be very careful what you do, for the Lord our God will have no part in unrighteousness or partiality or the taking of a bribe. The purpose of God for the government and for the citizenry is to do good kind of sets the stage now for the rest of the sermon today. So what is our role as citizens? But more importantly, what is our role as Christian citizens? Those who follow Christ. Well, according to Scripture, it's a, a combination role. 
The first being our subjection. Number three on your outline, our subjection to government. We read in, in, in Romans 13, verses 5 and following, Therefore it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For because of this you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing, render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, Fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. You see the word there that at the beginning of verse 5, it says, and therefore. In other words, because God is the originator of government, and because God has given us a twofold purpose of government, therefore we are to be in subjection to that government. Out of, the Bible says, fear, and consequences. We obviously don't want to suffer the consequences of breaking the law, but even more important than that, we want to have a blameless conscience before God and man. We read in, in Acts chapter 24, verse 16. It says, In view of this, I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience both before God and and before man. Peter goes on to tell us that our obedience will actually silence or put to shame those who would slander us. 1 Peter 2, 13-17 says, Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as to the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as a free man, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil. But use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. So part of that subjection, according to these verses in 5 through 7 of Romans 13, means that we are to pay our taxes. Matthew 22, 21, Jesus asked a question, uh, and they answered and said, It's Caesar's. And then J Jesus said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God. In other words, give to the government authorities those things that are theirs and give to God what belongs to God. Now that also means that as responsible Christians, we should work toward making sure that taxes are fair, that they're being used properly. Likewise, we're to give proper respect to, to all authorities. That is, we are to, to give fear to whom fear and honor to whom honor. So now the second part of that combo role I spoke of, the things that we are to do, is we are to, number four on your outline there, to have responsibility. We have some serious responsibilities as Christ-following citizens of this government. And that is because we have been blessed by God. And we really have. We have been blessed by God as Americans with a unique form of government. It's called a democratic republic. Republic means that politicians are, are elected to represent us in the government. The democracy part means that we, the people, choose <coughs> and elect those representatives. Now, this form of government comes with great responsibility for both the elected and the electors. See, we are not only to elect representatives, but we are to actually continue to hold them accountable in the ways in which they legislate. Now, part of that accountability happens at the ballot box. And as you know, that's coming up very shortly. People are already early voting and so forth, which frankly means for us, church, that if we're not voting we're actually shirking our responsibility 
before God who blessed us with this form of government. It means we're, as I've titled the message today, it means we're taking our blessing for granted. God has blessed us in a special way in this great nation. But we can take that blessing for granted. Now, as Christians, <clears throat> obviously, the Bible is to be our guide for everything. But we're speaking specifically about voting today and following the Bible. So it's to be our guide when we're selecting representatives. So here's another example <clears throat> of the series I've been doing of knowing what the Bible says but too often failing to take it serious in our day-to-day -day lives. So how then do biblical principles apply when we're considering who to vote for and the issues that we must be given concern to, the things that concern us as biblical Christians? Well, it has to be a matter of priority. During the the 1990s, many of you remember, there was a, a candidate running for office, and he pretty much coined the phrase, it's the economy, stupid. You probably remember that. Well, the truth is, it's been the economy for practically every election since then, and probably the ones before then. But as important as the economy is, and it is important, but it shouldn't be the top priority of Christ followers. And why is that? Well, because the economy is not specifically a biblical concern. While there are many biblical principles to guide economic systems, both, both national and, and individual, our priorities are to be determined by the issues of which the Bible gives us clear commands as Christian voters. Therefore, since government has a twofold purpose, according to Romans 13, 4 that we just read, that purpose being to promote what is good and to punish those who do evil, then our top priorities should be moral issues. You see, we must remember it is God not society, not human institutions, not even individuals, determine what is good and what is evil. God does that, and He does that for us in the commands, in the principles, in the precepts of His Holy Word. And according to God, a just judicial system is more important than the economy. Here's what we read in Deuteronomy, chapter 16, verse 19 and 20. It says, You shall not distort justice. You shall not be partial. You shall not take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and perverts the words of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall pursue, that you may live and possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you. So in the context of economics, God has promised us that He will provide for all of our needs if we will simply seek first His kingdom, His righteousness. We read this in Matthew 6, 33. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all of these things. And if you read this in the context that it's written in there in Matthew 6, He's talking about material things, economical things. He says, if you will seek first my kingdom, my righteousness, all of these other things will be added to you. God says, I'll take care of those things. You take care of the important things, I'll take care of those things. But also we read in Scripture that God's judgment is promised to those who pervert justice. Isaiah 10.1 says this, Woe to those who enact evil statutes, and to those who constantly record unjust decisions. So as Christians, we need to take voting seriously. And then we need to vote for the, the candidate
that would best reflect God's Romans 13 plan for government. Then we must not only vote for certain standards, we must also stand in opposition to governmental representatives and policies when they act contrary to the clear teachings of the Word of God. Therefore, in a real sense, our government and its decisions are reflections of we the people. Therefore, we the people bear the responsibility for it. If government officials are corrupt and evil, they were elected by we the people. And so we the people get what we deserve. However, as Christians, we also have the responsibility to see that God's standards are upheld and we're to work hard to have such evil and corrupt officials replaced by godly ones. That's what we get to do in the next few days at the ballot box. You see, when God's moral laws are transgressed and His purposes for government are not fulfilled, it's not only right, but it's absolutely necessary for us to speak out against those things. You see, a godly government is a blessing on all the people. Our cover verse today on our bulletin is from Proverbs 29 too, that says, when the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, people groan. Since political candidates will be a mixture of various moral standards, no two people are exactly alike on everything, there will be a mixture. So it'll be rare to find a candidate that rates well on everything some candidates and issues will, will come down to choices between bad and worse, sadly to say. But there are some issues, church, that are just downright evil. And they must be opposed. So I want to look at a, just a few major issues today that we need to take into account when we're going to vote. And then I want to ask a few questions along the way that should be on our minds as we evaluate the issues and the candidates that are running for any and every office. So again, on your outline, under, under responsibility, the first one I want to look at is life. The first moral priority is human life. And why is that? Because throughout the Bible, we're told a lot of things about life. Just to give you a few, we're told that God is the creator of life. We're told that, that all life, every single person, all life is created by God. We're told that all human life bears the image of God. We're told that the one who takes the life of another should be punished severely. We're told that life begins in the womb in many places throughout Scripture. We're told that every life is sacred. To kill a baby in the womb is to not only destroy the work of God, but it's also to attack the image of God. Abortion is the murder of a human being, just as infanticide and euthanasia are as well. There are candidates running for American political office that promote all of those things as acceptable in our society. They even promote these things in our society. And so we need to consider some, some questions when we as Christ-following voters 
get ready to vote. One question we need to ask is, what value does the candidate put on human life? We know the value God puts on it. We know we've been blessed with this opportunity by God. We are representing God when we go to that ballot box, just like everything else we do, we're representing God. So what value does the candidate put on human life? What protections do they advocate to protect human life? Is the candidate pro-life? Is he or she indifferent? Is she or he pro-abortion? What's their position on euthanasia? Infanticide? You see, those who won't protect the life of the most innocent and helpless among us, a baby in the womb, an elderly person near the end of life that has become pretty much fully dependent on someone else. Someone who will not protect those kind of lives cannot be trusted to protect anything else except their own interests, their own political interests. And so the first Biblical concept we need to look at when we approach the voting booth is life. The sanctity of human life. The second one is protection. Protection encompasses both internal and external threats. A police force protects against local threats. While armed forces protect against threats that might come from other countries. Some questions to consider. Does the candidate understand the protective role of government, both locally and nationally? Do they support and promote law and order? Do they understand that a safe country is a prosperous country, is a peaceful country? The third thing we need to look at is justice. Government has the responsibility to establish and execute justice. Presently, the responsibility to carry out justice in our nation is being hindered by political corruption, which those are the highest positions in in law enforcement in some cases have been called ignoring, even breaking certain laws to benefit particular favored class. We also have judges that rule based on the way they want things to be rather than according to what the law actually states. So some questions to consider as we approach the ballot box. Does the candidate uphold the rule of law because the Bible speaks a lot about the law and following the law and how God has put that there for a purpose does that candidate support an interpretation of the law based on our framers original intent or do they believe in a what they call a living constitution that can be reinterpreted at will Is the candidate subject to political corruption by influences from either inside or outside the government? Inside or outside the country? And then the fourth thing we need to think about is morality. God pronounces a woe upon those who attempt to reverse His order. We read about it in Isaiah 5.20. He says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Tragically, there are many in America today that are doing just that, and a large number of them.
that are turning everything that God has said upside down. A large number of them are politicians. But God clearly describes what is good and what is evil in the Bible. That's our guide. Leviticus chapter 18 gives a list of immoral sexual practices alongside child sacrifice. And he says these things are an abomination to the Lord. And they defile the land. Abortion in America today is, is our nation's version of child sacrifices. Many political leaders now support and promote sexual immorality of all kinds. So some questions to consider. Does the candidate seek to protect biblical marriage? Or do they want to redefine it in an in attempt to force society to accept an unbiblical standard? And that brings us to the next section. Section 5 on your outline, a biblical standard. And I want to focus the rest of our time right here because as Christ followers, this is what we ought to be about. A biblical standard. You see, God gives us a list in His Word a list of seven things to help us understand His assessment of human nature. And it might be very valuable to us in, in evaluating a political candidate. His personal standards as well as His political standards. So if you will turn with me to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. I'll give you just a minute to get there. Proverbs chapter 6, the wisdom book. We just want to read about three, three four verses here. This list I was telling you about says this. Proverbs 6, starting in verse 16. There are six things which the Lord hates. That ought to get our attention right there. But then he says, yes, seven, which are an abomination to him. Abomination is about as bad as it gets, folks. These are the things that God really hates. These are the things that are an abomination to him. Verse 17 says, number one is haughty eyes. Number two is a lying tongue. Number three are hands that shed innocent blood. Number four is a heart that devises wicked plans. Number five is feet that run rapidly to evil. Number six is a false witness who utters lies. And finally, number seven is one who spreads strife among brothers. So let's just look at those very quickly, those seven points. Haughty eyes. Haughty eyes refers to, to that condescending look that the crowd gives to, to someone else because they think themselves to be superior to other people. This is a common attitude among our political elite today, especially those that have been there for quite some time. We've seen the clips. We've seen the news stories. We've seen them live on TV. Many times during this political season, we've seen arrogant politicians that are caught, caught in the act of defying the rules that they demand that we live by. We need to be aware of proud and arrogant politicians and candidates who claim to know what's best for us, but really just want the government to control our lives. Haughty eyes. The next one's a lying tongue. This reveals a, a, a dishonest and a selfish character, striving to do what's best for themselves instead of what's best for others, others being those they represent. It seems like many politicians are striving to make lying actually into an art form these days. 
by the amount of practice they give to it. But a person that's characterized by lying cannot be trusted on anything. The Bible gives strong warning about those who practice lying. We read in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, but for the cowardly, here's another list, the cowardly and unbelieving, abominable, murderers, immoral persons, sorcerers and idolaters, and all liars. Their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You see, we should incorporate God's wisdom in this area when we're choosing those who will represent us. Proverbs 12, says, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal fairly, faithfully, are His delight. Those who deal faithfully are His delight. Now, obviously... All politicians will fail at some point. We're all human. But more is revealed about the integrity of a person by whether or not they admit it when they fail or, when they, or if they try to cover up their failures. And then we look at the next one, the hands that shed innocent blood. It's not only about the one who physically sheds innocent blood. The accomplices are also guilty, including those who allow it by either promoting laws, permitting it to be done, or by being just complacent in their actions to prevent it, by not doing what they could do to prevent it. Again, we need to ask their positions on abortion and fantasize euthanasia we need to know if they have hands that would shed innocent blood we need to know their positions on law enforcement and military and justice under the law and then we have a heart that devises wicked plans that's revealed by what the candidate promotes his wicked plans her wicked plans does their vision for the future does their goals for the present line up better with what God has written or what Satan desires? Do they obviously spend time in back rooms with one another devising plans and schemes to further their political agendas at any cost by going out onto the floor of Congress making speeches where they call good evil and evil good? Or do they promote morality and righteousness and strive to restrict what is evil in our nation? And then we have the feet rapidly to evil. Again, this describes someone who may sit in committees and devise schemes to bring down their adversaries and deceive the people, all while ensuring even more power for themselves at the expense of others? Are they self-centered at any cost? Or are they promoters for the good of all the people? It's another question we need to ask. And then we have a false witness. This is worse than the general liar because these lies make someone else a victim. These are lies about another person. You see, it's bad enough for us to lie about ourselves so that others will think we're something we're not or that we can do something we can't. But it's a lot worse to, de to, to attempt to destroy another person with lies. At present, we have a, a media in this country that is absolutely complicit with the lies of those they support. Lying has become the common denominator between politicians and the media. So we need to ask the question. 
This politician or candidate lie about other people. And the final abomination we read in this list in Proverbs is the one who spreads strife among brothers. We're living in one of the most divisive times in recent history. Some candidates want to end this division, while others attempt to thrive on it, to take advantage of the strife for personal gain. We need to ask the question, is the candidate known for real solutions, or are they known for simply playing politics? When these various abominations, these things that are abominations to God, when they're combined, we have the politics of personal, even national destruction. An evil but effective tactic used by wicked people to gain political power at any cost. Now let me say this. You'll probably never find a candidate that agrees with you 100% on every issue. We're just that diverse. But we are to evaluate carefully and make the best vote we can knowing this. As Christians, our primary goal is not the victory of our candidate our primary goal is to please our Lord by following His Word, even in this area. You see, God is sovereign, and God can be trusted to do the right thing. But here's what's interesting. God also trusts us as His followers to do the right things as well. And that's why he's given us this responsibility as voters of righteousness. In voting as Christians, we are to vote for people, yes, but we're also voting for policies. Because at the end of the day, it's the policies that, that make the difference in this type of government. You see, there, there are no perfect people, not even the most devout Christians. Let me ask you something. Did any of you make it through last week without committing a sin? Without committing a, a mistake, an injustice? Me neither. You see, we're all sinners, therefore we're all imperfect. But this means that sometimes our votes have to be largely about substance over style. Our votes have to be about policies over perfection. That is, what a politician does is more important than what he or she says. Because what they do affects the citizenry, it affects the nation, and more than anything else, it affects our standing before Almighty God as a nation. You've heard the conversations, I've heard the conversations till I'm just tired of the conversations. That people are having about standards and so forth before they can vote for a president or anyone else that holds office today. Many people act as though when they vote for a president, they're voting for their next Sunday school teacher or their next pastor. In fact, we've, we've elected in the past some pretty moral presidents who gave a lot of lip service to moral issues during the campaign but actually did little or pretty much nothing to promote righteousness once they were in office. But we felt good because we voted for someone that talked a good talk. 
We've also elected some immoral presidents in our past. Of course, the media was good at covering up their sins while they were in the moment. We only get to read about them or learn about them usually long after they're dead or at least out of office. I've read books about past politicians. I was shocked at what I learned. I didn't know it at the time. But here's what I want you to know about imperfect politicians. Even God, even God voted men who were far from perfect. Did you know that? And he was omniscient. He knew everything ahead of time. He knew ahead of the vote who these men were, what these men were capable of. I mean, let me give you a couple of examples. God voted for David. Remember King David? You know the stories of King David. King David was a pretty good guy, and he did a lot of great things. But he was also a man that got caught up in lust. He stole another man's wife. He committed adultery with her. She became pregnant. David decided to try to cover that up. He conspired with his general to commit murder, compromising his general. And then after all of that was said and done, David just kind of moved on as if nothing immoral had happened. Now we know that later David repented of those sins and so forth, but much later... Before David's death, he wanted to build a house for God. He wanted to build the temple. But God said, no. You can't build my house because you have too much blood on your hands, David. David had been a warrior. A lot of people had died at the hands of King David. And as I just mentioned, one of his own soldiers a dedicated soldier at the hands of King David. But here's what's interesting about King David. There is more in the Bible about King David than anybody else except Jesus Christ. We know a lot about King David. One of the things that we know about King David is, is that he became the standard for future kings. This was the guy that everybody looked to to say, I will, if I'm going to do it in a godly way, I want to do it like David did it. Generations later, we read things like this. King Hezekiah. When, when King Hezekiah became king and, and lived out his kingship, here's what we read. He did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. In other words, his standard was judged against David. Years after that, we read about another king, the little eight-year-old king who grew up, and, and the Bible says he did right in the sight of the Lord, and he walked in the ways of his father, David. Now, David wasn't his actual father. He was generations before. The standard was, how did you compare with David? Here's the point. King David wasn't always the most moral guy in the kingdom. He certainly wasn't perfect. But he was still the man God voted for to lead his nation. And what he did with that was a lot of good things. I could go into detail about the highs and the lows of King Solomon. But God voted for King Solomon. In other words, God put him into office. Here's my point. The decision this year is really not a difficult one. At least not for biblical Christians. There are lots of issues that we all look at. We talked about the economy earlier and that's a huge issue it always is and, and, and you know foreign policy and 
and, and peace treaties with Israel and, and all kinds of different things. All those things play in, but, but there are certain things, there are areas that should be especially important to the Christ follower because the Bible has spoken to us about these things. Again, this, is, this decision is not a difficult one for biblical Christians. In the areas of the sanctity of human life, in the areas of supporting law and order, in the areas of protecting religious freedom so that we can gather and worship, in the area of appointing justices who will apply the rule of law, the two sides that we've been given this year could not be more different. Obviously, none of the candidates who are running are perfect, as none of us are. But their stated and their proven politics, as both of them now have been in office, one for a long time and another one for a short time, but enough that we know what they have done to give us an idea of what they will do. So the things they've stated and the things they've proven in their politics reveal how they're really going to lead on the issues, the ones that are prescribed in God's Word. We don't have to wonder. How will they take God's Word? They've already told us. They've already shown us. You do the homework to decide who believes what. The point is, church, we want to continue to be free, to be able to share the most important message ever told, that of the life-saving gospel of Jesus Christ. And that begins by not taking our blessing for granted, the blessing that God has given us to have a role and a responsibility in this kind of government, to vote, to vote biblically, and then to hold politicians accountable biblically. That all begins, church, by us taking seriously the guidance and the commands that are found in God's holy word. For it's in God's, learn, God's word that we learn. We learn of the love of God for mankind there. We, love, we learn of the sacrifice of God for man that He made in sending His one and only Son to die on a cross there in our place to cover our sin debt so that if we put our full faith and trust in Jesus, we can be eternally saved from our sins. That's in the book. We need to continue to have the freedom to tell people what's in the book because our greatest responsibility on this planet, church, is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need a government that will get out of our way so that we can do that, not one that hinders us. For those of you listening and, and you're wondering about this gospel I've been talking about, let me just tell you, it simply says this, God loved you so much that he, he knew that you were a sinner and separated from Him forever. Unless He could find a way to change that about you, to remove your sin. And the only way that could happen was a death to that sin. But you couldn't do that. Only a holy God could do that. So He sent His Son to earth to die on a cross in your place. Not for His own sins because He had none, but because of your sin to remove your sin debt so that you then could enter into a relationship with God, so that you could spend all of eternity living with God. Jesus did that. He did that work on the cross. He did what you could never do. You could never be good enough. You could never give enough. You could never do anything enough to get rid of past sins, and sins have to be dealt with. 
by a holy God. Jesus dealt with them on that cross. He's told us if we will simply put our faith, our trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior, making Him Lord of our life, following Him, that we will be saved and we'll spend eternity with, with Him. If you're listening by way of the Internet today, the Holy Spirit of God has spoken to your heart and you want to make a decision like that, call us. There's a place on the website there. You can leave a comment. We'll get back in touch with you. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much. Again, as we began, we're, we're thankful for who you are. We're thankful for who you made us to be through Jesus. We thank you for the, the privilege, the blessing that you've given us to be involved in this, um, this blessed form of government that we have. Lord, help us not to take our blessing for granted. Help us to be ambassadors for Christ. And to not only take you with us wherever we go, to represent you wherever we go, whether it's on the, on the job or at school or in the neighborhood or in our families or, or anywhere else, help us to take that into the voting booth and then into the politicians' offices, Lord. to vote biblically and hold them accountable bi biblically as ambassadors for Christ. And the Lord, help us, the church, to continue to spread the good news of Jesus Christ to this nation and to the world. And it's in your name I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen.